Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. We're really pleased to have Rebecca Coakley with us today. Rebecca's a former presidential appointee and the exec director of the NCD. Uh, it's a really significant um, CV you have, uh, Rebecca. I'm really pleased that you can join us. It's really great to, to see people that are not only advocates, but you list yourself as a second generation advocate. So that's that's quite something. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and, and also how you, you came into advocacy. Obviously, there's something in the family, but um, tell us a little bit about it. Um, I literally rode into the disability rights movement on the back of my godmother's wheelchair. Um, both of my parents were advocates. Both of them were also little people. Um, our, our, the dwarfism gene is very strong in my family. Um, yeah. And so I was born and raised in Northern California where my mom ran the Disabled Student Center at a community college. And my father uh, was the executive director of the Center for Independent Living. Um, so I saw firsthand the work that they did on a daily basis to improve the lives of people with disabilities in our community. I also think growing up in San Francisco at the height of the, of the AIDS crisis really had a profound impact, um, particularly as it leads to the work that I like to do on intersectionality, uh, but also in terms of reaching beyond just the typical physical disability or mobility disability community in terms of the work that I do. Okay, so, um, gosh, the, the, the whole AIDS thing in, in, in San Francisco would have been particularly intense. Obviously, the, the, the center of the LBGT um, rights movement in the U.S. as well uh, hit very hard. Certainly, growing up in, in the U.K., we took a lead from what was going on in San Francisco uh, during that time. So, um, I'm sure it definitely shaped what you would what you would do. So, can you tell um, us, Limeys, this side of the pond, what it is that that the NCD does, um, and what it how it how it functions, and, and and what sort of executive role it is that that you're playing? Certainly. So, the National Council on Disability is over 35 years old. Um, we're a federal agency, but we're what they call an independent micro agency. Um, so we don't have a cabinet secretary. We, we're a standalone agency. And our job is advising Congress, the White House, and the broader disability community on all issues tied to Americans with disabilities. Um, we have 15 presidential appointees and a staff of 12. Um, and our appointees, a uh, majority of which are people with disabilities from all communities, all backgrounds uh, from around the country as well as a couple of individuals who are parents of people with disabilities or who run provider organizations or agencies that support people with disabilities. And quite literally, we work on every issue under the sun. Obviously, working on education and healthcare, employment, transportation, sort of the, the obvious uh, issues that we know are, are, have a tremendous impact on the lives of Americans with disabilities. But we also answer the call from the community when the community wants us to engage on an issue. Um, the, this is probably highlighted best by the work that the council does around the civil rights of parents with disabilities. Um, we know for a fact that in 37 states, if you're a parent with a disability, you can lose custody of your child solely for the basis, uh, solely on the basis of having a disability. And then also in the work that we're doing around police violence and people with disabilities. Okay. That's a huge remit then. Yeah. So I'm assuming you're glad there's 25 hours in every day and <laughs> three days in a week. Definitely. <laughs> so, um, Deborah, do you have a question? I do. I, I um, th Rebecca, thank you for being on Access Chat. We, um, you and I have known each other for many years, and I know that you have. It, it's really been pretty amazing to watch your career. I know you've been a big advocate and voice for uh, younger people with disabilities and you're a mom now yourself and it's I do think it's interesting when you talk about parents because when I first joined these conversations really in 2000 um, I had multiple people telling me well and and every once in a while it still happens I'm always surprised that um, 
oh yeah, we, you parents are, you know, you're, you're more trouble than you're worth and you don't really help. And, and by the way, there's a lot of truth in that, but uh, parents are part of the stakeholders that need to be ball, involved in the conversation. And as you're saying with the work you're doing with the National Council on Disability and your other work being a, a former presidential appointee under President Obama, it, it's, it's a multidimensional you know, uh, situation. I mean, all bringing in all of the stakeholders, making sure that, you know, we're in, in the United States also tracking what's happening globally and how can we learn from each other. Um, and so I have chosen to play a real big part in making a difference for my daughter and others as an employer and as marketing. And I was just wondering, I mean, I know that you're very active both from the National Council on Disability and as an individual and a parent um, on social media as well. And so um, I would be curious, you know, it, you know what your thoughts are on, um, well, before I even say that, one reason why we created Access Chat, which we created at, um, last November, so we're not even a year old, and it's amazing the you know the um, traction we're getting with it. So we we know people are very very interested in this, and we believe this is one of the many ways we can bring all the siloed groups together. Um, I also know you're a very big advocate advocate for women's rights and for African Americans' rights because I um, I mean it's always so intrigued with what you're tweeting, but. What can we do as communities, not just in the U.S., but globally using social media to really um, help bring us together and further all of our causes? You know, I think, um, I think back to when I started out doing national work um, in my late teens, early 20s with the National Youth Leadership Network, and then also later on um, with NCD's own Youth Advisory Committee. And I think during that period of the late 90s, early aughts, the disability community was deliberate and very intentional about bringing young people to the table. Um, when I moved here to DC in 2004, I joked that I only had one fr or two friends under the age of 40. And so what we spent some significant time doing was building up a network of young professionals with disabilities here in the district. Um, and so we started what's called the Hidden Army. And uh, we took the title from a reference that Joe Shapiro makes in No Pity, talking about the disability community as the hidden army. And we started with three of us, myself and Rachel Dorman, who's over at the VA now, and Daniel Davis, who's over at the Administrative uh, Administration for Community Living. And now the list is up to about 300 young professionals with and without disabilities that work and engage in disability policy circles. I really think if we're gonna be successful as a community, we need to take that level of intention and that level of deliberation um, into diversifying our community across race, ethnic, religious backgrounds, being inclusive, more, being more inclusive of women in leadership within our community, which I think is a significant issue that we don't often talk about. Um, also being more inclusive of the LGBTQIA community um, because there's so much overlap in the issues that we deal with as minority populations. Um, so quite literally to the extent that my husband and I were driving down Constitution Avenue a few weeks ago and saw a young, saw a young professional walking down the street using crutches, um, young African-American man, and he had a government badge around his neck. And I looked at my husband and I said, do you know him? And Patrick responded, no, I don't know him. Do you know him? And I said, no, but he obviously works for the government. Let's find out who he is. And so we played it out like a, um, like a spy movie almost. We did a we did a U-turn in the middle of Constitution Avenue. We opened up the sliding door of the minivan and my husband jumped out um, to talk to this guy. And it turned out that he was a senior attorney over at the Environmental Protection Agency and had no connection with the disability community. And so I really, and, and after he got over the initial fear that we were um, trying to pull like a take in on him, I guess, um, we ended up in a really great conversation. But I really do think that if we want this community to be reflective of the diversity of America, we have to take that level of intention and that level of uh, deliberateness into the work that we do. And so we have to reach across boundaries. We have to reach into other communities that are fighting the same fights we are. And, and as my colleague Talila Lewis always says, um, we spend too much time worrying about finding allies versus creating allies. Um, you know, I think we have a lot that we can learn specifically from the LGBTQIA community as it relates to 
how we engage with parents and family members. I think they've done a very successful job with organizations like PFLAG and others that have uh, really worked with parents and families to be supportive while at the same time maintaining self-determination and self-advocacy um, for, in that case, the individuals with, who are LGBTQIA and, in our case, individuals with disabilities. Yes, and that's a very powerful statement because one one way that we've been as successful just passing celebrating the Americans with Disabilities Act twenty five years, but um, is from the grassroots efforts. And Definitely. so, I I remember um, hearing Greg Vanderheiden say one time that one thing that we've got to do. Now he was talking more about accessibility, which is just a part of this conversation. But he was saying, we've got to stop eating our young. We've got to be more welcoming. We've got to be, like, it's so interesting what you're saying, Rebecca. All your friends were, nobody was under 40 but two of them because we are an aging community. And so it's just critical that, you know, the youth have a very powerful, empowered voice. And and I agree with what you're saying. We've got to learn from what the, uh, I'm used to saying LGBT and uh, you're saying yeah. QA, so you're teaching. QA, yeah. All right, cool. So um, it, it's it's it doesn't really matter if you um, what you what people think of that community, but we definitely can learn from that that community. We can learn so much, and um, I say that all the time when I'm speaking about this topic. So it's uh, very very powerful. I will tell you, there's this one organization that I uh, try to support um, and retweet things they say because they're young people really tr trying to find their power. And um, the other day I saw them post something about how bad corporations were and they're terrible. And I thought, okay, be careful also not popping all the way to the other side either, because to have our voices heard, once again, it's like when I started, oh no, you're not going to add value. You're just a parent. Well, yeah. I actually have added value as a parent and employer. So um, I just think the work that you're doing and, you know, the people you're bringing in and stopping on the side of the streets and say, hey, you should be involved. I, I think that's a powerful story. So thank you for all of your leadership on this. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I, I also agree around the, the whole LBGT. You're saying QA as well? QI. Uh, QI. Yeah, and asexual. Okay. All right. All right. Um, I wrote an article not that long ago talking about neurodiversity and why we needed to um, come out. And I, I literally, my, my rationale was that there's a similar level of stigma around oh, hidden disability. And, and what that community has done has learned to confront and reduce the stigma. And they've claimed back societal, well, claimed societal acceptance because there wasn't. Uh, and, and that's something that we need to do as people um, with hidden disabilities and with disabilities in general. Well, and I think also, I mean, one of the things that really struck me, we ended up having a, a meeting this last, actually, about I think back to July, um, because we've seen an uptick in, um, in mental health issues, mental health crises, and suicide in our LGBT young people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we sit and we come at it from the disability side, and we think if we can handle the disability bits and pieces of it, we have it taken care of, but we we really haven't done a good job within our own community of helping support the whole person. And what was striking to me was in a meeting with a bunch of my colleagues um, who are all in senior levels of federal agency management. You know, I said, "How many of you guys are running are funding programs that are um, that impact and that engage young people with disabilities?" And most of them said that they were. I said, well, how many of you are looking specifically at the issues of LGBTQIA, young people with disabilities? Because we actually are starting to get data that shows us that um, there is a very high likelihood, there is a very high percentage of young people with disabilities who also, um, uh, who also are out or, or um, uh, see themselves uh, as being LGBTQIA. And 
I got a room full of blank stares. And what was striking to me was half of the people that I was were talking to were LGBTQIA adults with disabilities. Um, and so I really think that for us to be successful in meeting the needs of the next generation, we really have to look at it from meeting, meeting them where they are and meeting all of who they are and making sure that we have mentors and role models and leadership in our community who represent all of who they are, um, you know, which I think is a, a unique opportunity. I mean, I saw that when I, when I, when um, my husband and I started dating, it was funny because I would take him to conferences with me um, when I was starting out doing youth engagement, youth leadership and youth development. And the young people, particularly the young women would always pull me aside and say, um, so how did you get a boyfriend? What's it like having a boyfriend? And I had never thought about the mentoring that I was doing or the development that I was trying to engage in with these young people as needing to take on that focus. But I realized it did because they weren't used to seeing other young people with disabilities in relationships. Um, yeah. And yeah. so, and I've seen it even more so since I've become a mom. I get asked about mom stuff all the time. We actually had a delegation in from Japan two weeks ago. Um, and at the end of the delegation meeting, uh, four of the young women asked our general counsel, who's also a mom, and I, if we could set up a time just to talk about parenting and how to be a mom with a disability. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. In, in the UK, there's a, a series that's been quite successful, actually. It's called The Undateables. Yeah. It's all, of, it's all about uh, disability dating. It's actually on its fifth series now, so it's it's... It's, I've it's heard awesome things well. about that. I'm a total, I'm a total BBC addict, um, but I haven't, I haven't caught up with that series yet. But I need to definitely do that. So um, I think there was a fear that that it was going to be sort of like a freak show TV, but actually, it's been somewhat more sensitively produced than that, and and, and uh, people, people are you know, meeting their challenges and, 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 and with, you know, there's some, some touching stories coming out of it, of, of, of real romance. But, I, but all, we, all we need now is a good disabled doctor, or a good disabled companion, and, you know, we'll be good. Yeah, more or less. No, there are plenty. We just don't, we just don't have them in the media. Um, and that's something that we covered uh, a few weeks back on Access Chat with Kurt Yeager. Um, I know BBC have a very ambitious program to increase the diversity of, um, of their programming, particularly for people with disabilities, but um, I don't think that's a universal ambition in, in the media worldwide. Oh, I would definitely agree. Be. You know, it, it's interesting uh, on this uh, topic. The um, one show that um, I'm sure you're aware of, Rebecca, uh, living in the United States, is um, Little Women of L.A. I think. And really, yeah. Well, I, I just want to say this about it. I started watching it because I I'm a big supporter of disabilities, and I I think bringing people into the into the media is so powerful. But what I remembered after watching it is you know people with disabilities are people and they can act stupid and ridiculous on tv too and and all prima donna and oh girl yeah and so it's like i had to stop watching it at a certain point because i get people are people but it was like i don't watch the housewives of i don't watch those types of shows typically so um, it, but it, I still think the more media we have, even if they are a little bit ridiculous, um, the more, once again, we see people are people, you know, I, I agree with you to a certain extent. And let me preface this by saying I grew up with a majority of those women. Oh, cool. Um, so I know them and their families, um, from most of my childhood and adolescence. Um, I think... I have a real hard time with reality television, especially with um, little TV. Um, and I think, you know, it's a couple of things. One, I think that I think creating education and awareness is a good thing, but it also creates a level of voyeurism. Um, I, I, I've talked to a number of female friends of mine who are also um, LP women, and we feel like we've seen street harassment of LP women go up. Wow. Um, 
as more of these shows have been on because people feel like they can just come up and talk to you. People feel like they can just holler at you or follow you down the street yelling midget, 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 midget. Um, wow. And, you know, the second thing for me as a mom is I would prefer that my kids, if we're going to see little people on television, um, see little people on television getting educations. Right. Going to work, having jobs, um, having families, not throwing drinks in each other's faces. Not that right. there's anything wrong with throwing drinks in each other's faces. I but, know. Um, you know, and so we're very deliberate about the um, types of media, specifically around people with disabilities that our kids see at home. Right. And so our kids might watch um, the little couple with... Um, with Dr. Jen and her husband and their two kids who they think are awesome. Or they may watch the little family who are actual friends of ours in, um, in Annapolis, um, where the dad's a carpenter, um, and there's a, and Michelle's the mom and she's awesome. And we were just actually at a, um, uh, we went to the water park with them this last weekend. Um, and so they see their friends, Kate, Cece and Jack and Michelle and Dan and, folks that they know and they can look to as, as positive role models. I can't tell you how many times, even during the, during the eighties, um, we used to call it the, the pre, you know, before they called how people dress the morning after the walk of shame, we used to call it the walk of shame when we would walk out of a movie that we were really excited to go see. And then all of a sudden halfway in the movie, there's a little person doing something dumb in it. Right. And you walk out of the theater knowing everyone is looking at you. Ugh. Um, and so, we're very um, discerning about the type of imagery. I mean, I also think there's a certain level of voyeurism that comes with it. I'm not interested. I don't know most people that would be like, oh, let me just sit and watch a show about people who are Jewish and let me really get into it because I'm not Jewish or people who are African-American, um, you know, because I'm not African-American, but I'm going to see that and I'm going to assume that that's what all African-Americans are like. Right, right. There's and a I danger. Think, there's a danger to I it. There really is that reality with little people right right you know, it was, people, you know i get asked daily about those shows i get when i'm, when I'm at, when i used to interview people for jobs at the white house i would get asked about those shows yeah uh, yeah i was uh, i i think it's important yeah uh, the the reality shows are just not my cup of tea and and i yeah. And I don't have enough time in the day as it is, and I, I'm very careful about how I spend my time. So, anyway, but Antonio, also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to say one last thing about it. I also think there really is um, the challenge that shows a lot of entertainment to little people. The money doesn't come back to our community. The money goes into the pockets of, of average high media heads. We're not seeing people with disabilities being hired on these shows as directors in most cases as producers, um, you know, and script design, editing, etc. And so while it's all well and good that we're throwing shadow puppets up against the wall and, and the masses are being entertained by it, the money is not returning to the LP community. Which is a good, good point. Yeah. Antonio, I, I know you've got a question. Yes, it's, it's uh, related with, with this topic, Rebecca, is that... What are, have you done any type of work engaging with personalities that you know that can work as a positive role models? You know, actors, singers, you know, politicians. Uh, how can you? What type of work have you done to, with them? Or how can you bring them to this type of conversation to highlight the work that they are doing? You know, I think there are people that are really doing good work, um, and I actually have to highlight somebody in the UK. I have to shout out Sinead Burke who's a, a fashion writer, who's a, a young woman with achondroplasia, who I love. Her fashion blog is called Mini Melange. You should totally check it out. Um, you know, and I think tapping folks that are, and for me, it doesn't just have to be little people, and it can't just be little people. Right. Um, you know, I think looking at what Jillian Mercado is doing in fashion is amazing. Um, the fact she just got signed to IMG Modeling is a huge breakthrough for the disability community. Um, you know, I think we are seeing more folks take responsibility and, and be accountable for how we talk about disability in the media. But I still think there's a, a really long way to go. Um, as it relates to folks in sort of the political sphere, you know, I think um, we do have a lot of allies. I think we also have to focus on how, how we act as allies. 
Um, you know, one of the things that has thrown me off in the last several weeks is as we've been doing all this work on police violence of people with disabilities, um, I've been reached out to by a couple of folks who said, you know, uh, who come to me with the all lives matter thing, which to me as the mom of two African-Americans with disabilities, I'm so sick of hearing and it doesn't make us good allies. Um, you know, and instead I, I really encouraged folks to be looking at the intersection of race and disability as it comes to this issue. And we've been very successful in terms of our outreach with the broader civil rights community in taking that approach, saying, okay, of these, you know, 10 cases that you're concerned about, we have information that tells us that between five to seven of them are individuals with disabilities. So how can we help in this dialogue? And I think as the disability community, we're very prone to sit and whine and finger point and say, but why aren't we at the table? But why aren't we at the table? But we're very reticent to create our own table and make sure those groups are at the table. Uh, do, you, do you have any sort of statistics? Are you producing any type of statis statistics nationally? That you know that can and then can and then are you publishing that that data in order to help the media to understand better what is out there? We actually are proposing this year, um, this next year in our body of work. It was proposed at our, our summer council meeting, um, specifically looking at media portrayals of mental health um, and figuring out how to better um, portray mental health and mental health disabilities in the context of the media, because I think it's a huge issue, particularly for uh, folks in, in post-secondary and, and college age people, um, where we know so many mental health disabilities have that period as, as the onset period. Um, you know, it's not our business to be policing the media. That's not our job. I mean, our job, they're, they're not one of the constituencies that we're tasked with informing. Um, but we really try to make our resources and our tools and, and the recommendations that we develop, and in many cases, actually, the model legislation that we develop or a number of our reports available to folks on the grassroots level so that as they inform the media, they have the tools and the information that they need to be successful. Um, I'm very interested to see how you think the, the work that you're doing in the United States can translate globally because I think that we live in a joined up world now. Uh, software, media, the internet means that anyone anywhere can connect, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Antonio in Portugal, Deborah in, in New Jersey, you in DC, me sat somewhere raining in England, uh, <laughs> all pushing for the same cause. So. What do you think it will take to make a global disability movement more effective? Because we are quite disparate at the moment, although the, the opportunities are there right now for us to be able to, to take the next steps and, and, and really push for greater inclusion. You know, I think a big piece of it is, is for our folks really understanding what people have in common. Um, I think there still really is that struggle, I think especially when you're looking at the issues globally. Yes, technology is great, but we still have such a small number of people with disabilities traveling abroad um, from anywhere in the world, um, doing exchange programs. And I'm actually really excited now to see uh, the Peace Corps put out proposed guidance on increasing the number of people with disabilities that are eligible to join the Peace Corps, because I think that's a huge deal. I think it could have a, have a tremendous impact on the global perception of people with disabilities and the global connectedness of people with disabilities. You know, I think um, part of it really is the information sharing piece. I think for me, it's been fascinating via Twitter to connect with advocates in Africa and advocates in Egypt um, and to keep an eye on all the, all the happenstance that's going on over across the pond as it relates to some of the austerity cuts in the UK. Um, yeah. You know, and so to be able to real time hop on the Internet and see what's happening, I think, is really cool, is really important and really cool. And at the same time, I think um, making that more available and letting people know that that's out there, I think, is a big thing. Um, you know, and at the same time, while I think international policy is really important, uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting, and you saw it this last year um, with the ongoing conversation around the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, if you ask young people with disabilities in this country what the most important issues to work on are, rarely do they say the CRPD. Most likely they say education or employment. 
Um, so I think the U.S. still has a long way to go in terms of um, meeting the bar that they've proposed as it relates to expectation management for young people with disabilities um, in our own country, and then thinking more globally about how then do we um, create more international awareness going forward. Well said. Well said. And, and more soccer. I think soccer and Doctor Who can create international awareness on disability <laughs> and scotch. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, the important definitely Scotch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. We're, we're bang on our half hour. So I'd like to thank you very much. It's been That's a fascinating so. conversation. Um, once again, thank you, Rebecca Coakley. Thank you. Thanks.